<laughs> hey, this is Milana Rašić and you're listening to the A Space. Hello everyone and welcome to the A Space, the volleyball podcast brought to you by CEV where every week we are joined by well one of the best players in the world. And this week is no different. It is episode three of three, the final episode with Milena Rasic. Hi, Milena. Hello. <laughs> and, <laughs> and not just one, but two Champions League medal winning middle blockers. It's podcast favorite, Key Michael. Welcome back. <laughs> I was wondering how you were going to introduce me. I, I was too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you came up with something on the fly there. Um, <laughs> hi, Dave. How are you? Good to see you guys. Happy to be here. Good. Well, I'm happy you're both here. I'm happy to be here too. Um, judging by your backgrounds, again, if you're brand new to the A space, then you've got two great episodes with Melena to catch up with. But we do this via Zoom remotely, and I get a little window into your lives so I can see, Key, that you're still in France and you're still uh, back home in Serbia, Milena, and I'm still back here in London as well. So we can pass by all of that stuff. Um, has anything fun happened, Milena, since the last time we spoke? <laughs> Actually, there's a lot of things happened, but uh, I, have to, I have to confess that I'm not that nervous anymore. Oh, good. <laughs> like in the first episode. Good. Yeah, uh, me too. Same. Well, fun, that's fantastic news. Uh, in episodes one and two, we spoke about your club success and your international success, of which has been very, very well documented. And, and thank you for giving us a, a newer and unique insight into that, Milena. But today, Key, um, who has a degree in psychology, <laughs> wants to look deep into your Ooh. your path. <laughs> <laughs> you won't have seen this uh, because we're on Zoom, but Key's gone ooh and done like magic fingers towards her web. <laughs> um, because every time someone says, "Oh, you've studied psychology," can you read my ra- can you read my mind right now? What? That's what I was can doing. You? I was reading your mind. <laughs> Did it work? You? <laughs> like you've got yes. a crystal ball. Um, but today yeah. it's it's path to the podium. Everybody's volley well, all, all professionals' volleyball journey starts somewhere, and end somewhere the two of you it hasn't ended yet but it certainly started so so let's find out i am gonna butcher the club name where your career began melena shumadia 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 i was close i was close (laughs) close Um, enough no it's good it's good so how did you start when did you when did you first arrive at shumadia uh that was uh 19 years ago and uh, actually, I didn't plan to to start playing volleyball. Just it was uh, out of accident that I there there was some older guy, actually my first coach. He came to our school and he said uh, like all the tall girls we 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 will start uh, with the volleyball school close to your school. There was a gym, and said uh, if you want you can come tomorrow at that in that time to try. And if you like it, you can stay and practice. If you don't, you can just go back and that's all. So I was like, why not? I can go and give it a shot. And actually, I like it a lot from the first moment, and uh, I just decided to keep going. And then, uh, I don't know, after that, uh, there was a, maybe three times a week practice or something, and I was really still young and maybe just talented at that time, like they said, but I didn't know anything about volleyball. So after that, I started practicing also with some uh, really good coaches, and then uh, I started playing with the uh, A team. Wow. Uh, with 18 when I was, uh, I think, 15 or 16. So that was five years later. So what kind of level was that then? Uh, when I started? Yeah, so, you, so when you were playing for the A team, what, what division was that in, in Serbian volleyball? It was the, the first B league. That's like kind of second division here. And uh, we, uh, we were the first. And then wow. we were supposed to go to the Super League. But uh, I was really the youngest one there, and everyone uh, watched me like their kids. <laughs> and I was really skinny like this. Like, two of me can wear these shorts that they gave me. <laughs> yes, I had the same problem. <laughs> really, I, they're I, meant like, to I be spandex. Skirt. They were not spandex on, on me. No, there, there, there was no spandex at that time. So it was yeah. like I had a skirt with a, <laughs> yeah. legs like this. <laughs> and I was really me. shy, and I just... I was afraid to talk with all of them because they were all older than me but 
course, after that, I, when they came to me and said, okay, just relax and enjoy. And then I started making friendships there and I started talking, actually. Amazing. Because I, I read this, but given that you've been such a successful middle blocker, I wasn't sure if it was true or not. Have you played both Libero and Setter in your early years as well? I played all the positions. Wow. <laughs> actually, I started as a setter. Wow. That's really, that sounds so funny right now because it's really, uh, I look so funny when I set the ball. <laughs> but uh, I started as a setter, but they went, when they saw that I'm growing up super fast, they just changed. The, I, I started playing their middle blocker that time. Then uh, with the national team, uh, yacht national team, they needed the uh, opposite. So they just put me to play opposite there because they want the tall team. We played one European Championship and we were fourth, I think. And uh, Libero, I was on uh, one game because our Libero was injured. And they just gave me another jersey and they said, OK, you play Libero this game. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't get a choice. That's they a, just yeah. Put you. Oh, <laughs> I was that. running from the ball, but OK. <laughs> the ball goes one way, you go the you other. You know, way. the middle blockers are doing in defense. They are escaping from the ball. All yeah, time. So we kill them. <laughs> but surely it's and helped then, you. Surely it's it's been up nothing but positive. The fact that you've played all these positions and yeah. because sometimes I I I feel I missed out a little bit when I was younger. I was a middle from day one, and I never sat. I never did defense. I barely even served. And then I come, you know, grow up in the pros, and then I'm you're expected to be able to do these things so i feel like uh you probably did well to do to be really well-rounded from the beginning i don't know they just they just tried everything at the end yeah. i finished like middle blocker because i was really tall and skinny just bouncing around bing 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 bing. okay you yeah. land here <laughs> <laughs> um so at what point did professional sport become a reality and was it was it you who really pushed for it or was it just kind of the direction you went in because of your talent uh, from the first moment I started practicing volleyball I, I liked it a lot and uh, I thought okay why not why uh, why to not try and to see if I can do more than this and then the moment when they called me for the A team I was really happy and then I was like okay this is what I'm going to do in the next couple of years I really didn't even dream about being called for the national team and then after to go abroad, it was really like a dream to me. I just, I don't know, I just loved sports since I was a kid. So I was really happy with uh, playing uh, volleyball. When I was a kid, I used to play only soccer because I, I was the only girl playing with boys soccer. So at least I was really in love really? with ball. Yes, I, I played a lot. And then, uh, I don't know, I just felt like, that's it. Okay, just give it a shot and see what is, what is going on. Uh, you mentioned sort of soccer there and, and growing up and loving sport. Who were your sporting heroes when you were a child? Uh, I didn't have any, like, hero from the athletes. I just, my only hero is my mom because she was... Uh, always supporting me and actually she didn't push me to do anything she just said okay do whatever you you want to do what you like to do and if you want to play volleyball just go and play volleyball because because she she saw how happy I was when I was, was going for practice and uh, she was just a big moral support to me from the day one so I'm really thankful thankful for for that her was she a sports person or were there any other sort of talented athletes in your family she used to play handball, but she's, she was not really talented. Actually, I don't have any, any person in my family that, that's doing sports. I really? Sometimes I feel, I feel like, you know, I just someone gave, gave me to them. <laughs> <Like there is, laughs> they found you under a bush. <laughs> yes, <laughs> in front of their door. And uh, I don't know, uh, there is really not that I know that there is a person in my family that actually was doing sports before. Wow. What about your family, Key? And what, did you have any heroes? Well, my family, my dad played basketball. And I was sure that I was supposed to play basketball, but I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you ever played me a lot, but I, being the skinny kid, I would always get like elbows in my ribs. And, you know, people always kind of like, you know, 
bulking you out and I, I hated it. I just absolutely hated it. So I'm, I'm happy that I found volleyball as well. <laughs> I used to play basketball for school. Yeah. And I actually, I love basketball. I used to play for school and uh, actually I played all the sports for school just to not go for classes. <laughs> I just, even I played handball, even, I don't know, I was sitting on the bench for handball, was it, but still I was part of the team. I had to, was uh, it like a choice, either sport or school? Because I feel like a lot of kids would probably choose sport. <laughs> I, I, actually, I was pretty good, good also in school. I just uh, preferred to go to the gym and do some sports than to stay in the, in the classroom and to learn. Yeah. At, at home, I had my homework. I, I did a good job at school, but still, sports was number one. For sure. Yeah. Do you uh, do you remember any of your sort of teachers and and coaches at school who first encouraged you to to sort of fall in love with sport? Yes, I remember all of them. Some of them, unfortunately, they're not alive anymore because they were also at that time uh, pretty old. But uh, they also all the teachers. All the teachers they had really helped me a lot. Mm. Because also I had to to miss some uh, class because of the um, of the my practice of volleyball. So they always they were full of um, support and they said, okay, no problem, just go. But whenever you want to go, just go, and that's all. I've read a lovely quote from you um, in an interview that you did with the FIVB. Well, it was last year now. Where does time go? Anyway, um, and you said, when I started playing volleyball, it was my escape from reality. Um, how was it then when volleyball became your reality? Or does it still feel a little bit like an escape now? No, I don't feel it like that anymore. Because actually, I said that it was my escape from reality because uh, I was born on, on Kosovo. And uh, in that war, 99, I had to leave my home. And uh, uh, we changed the city and we stayed without literally anything. So we had to find a place to live. We were with some cousins in that city where I started playing. We changed a lot of ho- homes and everything. And then I started playing volleyball and I just felt so happy to go there and, you know, do sport and to meet other people and just, uh, let's say, to escape from reality for one and a half hour, two hours, it that doesn't matter. And I just uh, thought, okay, this will help me a lot. Maybe I will grow up in a, you know, in a, in a good person and uh, the person that who is going to meet a lot of players. Maybe I will travel one day. Maybe I will play for national team. Who knows? And uh, that was like my motivation to, to go harder, to go for every practice, to give 100% of myself. And that's it. So when you did have the chance to, to turn pro then, was that... I'm not sure if this is the right word, so do, do forgive me. Um, but the chance to be a professional sports person was that a kind of ticket to a a better life or a different life to to what might have been expected actually yes because also my mom she was trying to to give uh, all that she could at that moment to me to to make me happy but it, that was really not much at that time so also uh, the first thing in my head was like okay i'm going to go pro in volleyball to earn some money to to uh, make her life better in the future and uh, that's what actually made me to super stubborn with volleyball so I will push and push until I, I make it uh, I, until I make my goal true so it's that's it that was really my my biggest motivation only my mom and that's that's a great motivation yeah that's so beautiful and that's the kind of thing if you hear that story you think you will never stop playing volleyball because for you it's it's the one in the same that that you as a as a person and you volleyball that's your why is bigger than just volleyball you know what i mean yeah that's, that's why i, I love volleyball yeah. because it, it changed my life that's all yeah and also wasn't it when you interviewed um giovanni dave he said he loves players or what was his exact quote that he that you have to have gone through some struggle yeah. to be a great player you you'll remember better than i am but i think that's probably exactly why you and giovanni get along milena <laughs> Can be, I don't know. <laughs> Can be. No, he did say that. I, I, he, I think he was, um, yeah, he was referring to a few of the, the players of, of your kind of age and a little bit older, Milena, when particularly for female athletes, there were real barriers to overcome before you could turn professional, not just 
what life had dealt you, but also the, the other things. And, and I speak to James Fielden about this uh, regularly, and I'm going to get in real trouble for this, but I've already started, so I'll finish. <laughs> um, very often when we speak to female athletes uh, in an interview sense, you get a little bit more out of them than you do from their male counterparts. And I think, again, I can only go on my personal experience because I am neither a professional athlete nor a female. However, it feels as though it feels as though there are certain things that the, that you have to overcome, um, sort of personally, professionally, physically, to to just get onto the court in the first place. And and as a result, I must say, you're an absolute joy. Um, you you two you two and uh, and beyond as well. But when you signed that first pro contract just to just to bring it back before I dig myself an even deeper hole thank you for <laughs> me both. Um, when you signed that first pro contract Milena did that feel like uh, like you'd achieved something did it feel like you you'd made it T- take me back to to that moment and and your emotions when it became a reality for me one of the best uh, feelings is when you get your first salary uh-huh. Like still you are young, but still you get your salary that you can buy something, you know, for yourself that you don't have to ask someone else to buy it for you, someone, someone from your family that you okay. get your first money paid. And uh, it's, it's really <laughs> one of the best feelings. I can say that. <laughs> what but, was the first thing you bought I mean, for yourself? And I bought some, some of the food for, for fridge. That was the first thing. I didn't really <laughs> buy some, some clothes or something. I didn't need it at that time. <laughs> But uh, uh, really one of the best, best feelings for sure. And uh, actually that was really a small amount of money, but I felt like I, I, I got millions, you know. <laughs> Do you remember what you bought with your first volleyball paycheck, Key? Um, probably course, something silly. <laughs> but you went through the, the US collegiate system, so you played right. top level for, what, three or four years and didn't get a penny. So when yeah, you signed that true. pro contract, that must have felt pretty amazing. True. Well, I went a completely roundabout way to going pro. <laughs> I, <laughs> I played college and then I quit volleyball, cold turkey, to live in Australia and to study there. <laughs> and then I said, you know what, maybe I'll give it a shot again. And I came over to Germany. And I can't remember what I would have bought with my first paycheck. Probably nothing big because it wasn't very big. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one of or probably my... some volleyball shoes, just <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe some new shoes volleyball shoes. Or, yeah, go out to dinner with friends. Sushi. That's probably what it was. I love sushi. <laughs> my um, one of my dearest friends. Um, we worked together at the London Olympics. I was working at the volleyball. He was working at the boxing, and we got paid for the whole Olympics in one big lump sum. And like an idiot, he went out and he spent it all on an expensive watch and I was like oh wow that watch is great and then six months later he was skint he was on the bare bones and he had to sell this watch in a pawn shop (laughs) just blew his entire paycheck on this Swiss watch so I'm glad you two were were more sensible with your first um, (laughs) with your first professional paychecks and so the the first pro contract then was that Again, I'm going to mess this up. Uh, Dinamo Azotara Panchevo, close. Dinamo is enough. Ah, okay. Was, was <laughs> so so Dinamo was that was that a pro contract or was Calm the first pro contract? It was the first pro contract because um, Dinamo at that time they they played the first league, mm-hmm. so we had a chance to compete with the best teams in Serbia at that time when the the volleyball here in Serbia was a much higher level level so uh yeah that was my first contract that actually i i left the city where i where i lived with the mom before and uh yeah i spent there for four years before i i left to can when you moved to can then because you you know you've you've spoken about your mum in such high esteem and, and she was a huge part of your life and you a huge part of hers was it ever a difficult decision for you to to move country uh yes the first month it was really difficult for me because i was all alone there in the apartment and then just you know when you have to to find a way to cook for yourself to do something you know because (laughs) before mom was always there to make a lunch when you come back from practice or dinner at night but now you're just all alone 
in in between four walls and like okay what am i going to do now but <laughs> luckily luckily i had like five or six serbians at that time in Cannes. Uh, also anja spasovic the old uh, player national team maybe you know her she was also there she was like a mom to me literally she mm. was really like trying to help me on all possible ways and uh, that's that's what actually helped me to to feel like home there and after that i i, I felt much better and uh let's say I got used to it. Mm. Yeah, because that's the thing. It's more about the teammates and the friendships you make than actually where you are in the world. I mean, your apartment and your you know, club, let's say, is not as important as the people that are there, the people that you meet and the people that make you feel like you're home away from home. So, yeah, I agree with nice that. Mm. I'm quite intrigued by, uh, by the cooking now. What was the first thing you learned to cook when you were in Cannes? Chicken. Chicken. <laughs> the most simple thing <laughs> yeah like basic pasta with like butter basic, melted exactly. on top of it <laughs> risotto and chicken and that's all and some that's soup. still my level of <laughs> hey, cooking risotto, so don't feel risotto's bad risotto's <laughs> hard man you can really mess up a risotto well i can really mess up a risotto. it was a simple one huh? who cares but now during these quarantine days i i learned to cook a lot actually because i was super bored and uh, yeah. most of the time I was Googling, you know, receipts and everything. Just what am I going to eat tomorrow? Yeah. It was really funny to see me in the kitchen. Because uh, <laughs> normally I'm not that kind of. Uh. <laughs> next time I'm in Serbia, what's, um, what's the Serbian cuisine that I should try? I'm not familiar with a good Serbian dish. No, there is a lot you have to try. But uh, for example, if you come to Belgrade, you go to the street named Skadarlia. Skadarlia. Okay, I, I, I'll write it to you. Okay. Yeah. And there is a street with a lot of uh, traditional restaurants with traditional food. And you can eat literally whatever you want and you will like it for sure. Because we have different, I mean, it's not that much different meat, but with the, it just tastes uh, different. And also, for example, uh, Sarma. Maybe you tried, maybe not. No. Also yeah. in Turkey, they have sarma. Maybe yeah. you know. Okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, but different one. It's like kebab. It's like kebab. It's like meat. No, 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 no. No. It's, a, like a, it's a meat inside. <laughs> I doesn't matter. But anyway, you have to try. Also, there is some meat inside, but uh, sarma is for sure that that's the thing you have to try in the country. Also, but, moussaka, for example. Yeah. I'm in. Oh, I'm in. Moussaka, I know. Moussaka, I really like. Moussaka is kind of like um, lasagna, right? But just with eggplant? Kind of, yeah. Not yeah. with eggplants, but with the uh, potatoes. Oh, okay. okay. I, I'm in. If there's, if there's heavy carbs in, I am yeah. in. <laughs> <laughs> but you, so, can gain, you, you can gain a lot of kilos if you try to eat all that, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Especially, Especially if you lockdown. don't do anything right now. I am talking to I'm talking to two people here who've told me that they've struggled to get shorts to fit because they were too skinny, <laughs> and now you're talking to me about gaining kilos. Come on! <laughs> it's different once the metabolism slows down. I don't know. I feel I feel a little bit softer since quarantine started. <laughs> so evil. Come on, that was twenty years ago. <laughs> yeah exactly things have changed <laughs> oh my goodness gracious me um so so you're in calm then you're a you're a professional you've started to win things with the serbian national team it felt like all you had to do in Khan was was turn up to win. actually key you've you've spent uh you've spent some time playing in france you're in yeah. the south of france right now um I am what are your thoughts on Khan as a team and going to the it's the palais de victoire is that where they play yeah yeah yeah. But the, the palette never seems to get full. That's something I always wondered about in Cannes. Maybe it was different when you were playing there, but it's this huge stadium and it's, they're always one of, one of, if not the best team in France. But in the last few years, it doesn't really get full. They don't have a huge following of fan base, which always surprised me. I don't, I don't really know because I didn't follow that much in the last two years. But mm -hmm. also before, uh, I mean, the gym is really huge, like you said, and it's... Yeah impossible to make it full but still they have their own fans like they're coming every single game doesn't matter if yeah. it's important or not they're coming there they're a bit loud and uh, you can see they they love the team so much so it's, it's really nice to see right let's bring this let's bring this back to your your path to the podium then Elena uh, you've talked about your 
relationships with coaches and how they how you're very thankful to them uh, of course currently uh, with Giovanni at Vakif Bank and Key, we end up talking about Giovanni every week. There's, there's mm-hmm. things we always talk about, Milena. We always end up talking about Giovanni. We always end up talking about uh, the London 2012 Olympics. And I always like to drop in the fact that Key's got a Champions League medal. Because she always, <laughs> Which I don't mind. <laughs> she always plays it down. Um, but on, like on, on the way up, with your, with your sort of coaches at the start of, uh, of your, not necessarily your career, but, but your journey, um, did you ever sort of speak to any of them or did any of your first coaches get in touch when you became a professional player to sort of say congratulations or I always knew you'd do it or, or that kind of thing? Uh, I, stay, I stayed in touch with a couple of them because I also I really love the moment when I see them after so many years and they always uh, have to say something that will make you really happy <laughs> or motivated <laughs> to, to keep going. So yeah, that's mostly like ah, I I knew that you will you will do this. I knew that you will play for that club, or I knew that you will play for national team one day. It's really it's really nice of them. Uh, but really, like you said, I'm thankful to all of them that I had the chance to work with, especially the last time with the, with Tezic and Giovanni. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so really, I learned I learned a lot from them, not only as a player but also as a person. Is coaching something that interests you? Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> um, is coaching something that interests you? Would you ever be interested in becoming a coach yourself? Oh, th- there is a time that I think about that. But at the end, I don't think I, I can be that patient, you know, with the, <laughs> with the players. I'm pretty, I'm pretty bad with that. Like, I can explode in a minute. But uh, I don't know. Maybe someday I will. I will try to to help some kids to some, to do. I don't know some uh, ages that they just start playing volleyball. I think that would be much easier <laughs> <laughs> than to to be a coach of a professional team. I don't know. We will see. Be the bad cop for the uh, for the national team, or <laughs> and you're very often referred to as the best middle blocker in the world. Um, is that something that you're comfortable with? Uh, I hate when they say that. <laughs> 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 I don't really feel comfortable with that sentence. Uh, um, uh, actually, I, I, had a, I had a chance to work and play with a lot of really great middle blockers. For example, with this uh, Victoria Rava from, from France. Uh, the, she's a legend there. And uh, I just had the opportunity to watch her on practice and learn a lot from her. And uh, I think that's, that's the, the, the best part of uh, me being a middle blocker, that just uh, I, I was watching and learning from all of them. And then I, I just tried to, to do that by myself. So I think, yeah, that's, that's the main reason why I actually uh, succeed as a middle blocker. That's, that's the exact answer I wanted, actually. Because at no point there did you say, I'm not the best middle blocker in the world. You just said, I don't like it when people say. (laughs) I really don't like that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It is is something that that comes up quite a lot, though, isn't it? I mean, there are a number of articles that say, Milena Rasic, best middle blocker in the world. Why do you think that is? (laughs) I mean, probably there is a... That a lot of players that they, they are saying that, but actually I really don't like that because uh, I don't know. I told you already that there is a lot of great middle blockers all over the world, so I just don't like to to hear that like you are mm. best middle blocker there or there. It's really I don't feel comfortable with that. Yeah, that's that's fair enough. Um, talk to me about about taking a break from the national team because. You're not the only one who, who did it, are you? Because Tiana took, took a break as well. Was that a difficult decision for you? And was it, was it welcomed by your teammates and the coaches? Did everybody understand? Actually, it was a really difficult decision because uh, at that point, I felt like I need rest mm-hmm. mentally and physically. I just couldn't go more because there is a 12 years uh, on non-stop volleyball. I just I needed to take a rest to be more with my family and just to, you know, to clear my mind from volleyball at that point because it, I, I, I was in really great shape, so I felt really bad. 
And uh, then I just invited Terzic because I had a, I was lucky because he was a coach of Fenerbahce at that time. So we were in the same city. I invited him for dinner and then uh, we spoke and I told him like, okay, and can I take a rest this summer? Because uh, I really need it. Otherwise I will be really bad mentally mostly. <laughs> That it it would be so difficult to make me to make me practice in a good way, and he said no problem, of course. And then I had three months off, and then when I, when I came back, I was really, I was really happy to to be back. And uh, actually, I needed a lot of time to to make it look good on the court. And uh, that was a lesson for me, of course. But at the end, uh, I spent a lot of time with my family. That's what I, I needed the most. And then, uh, of course, now I'm back also to national team. Did you ever worry that if you took time off, then you wouldn't get the chance to play in the national team again, that somebody might come and fill your spot? <laughs> That's also possible because we always had a really good middle blockers in our national team. And also, for, also now it's not sure that I'm going to, to be in first six in national team. I have, to, I have to work hard for that, of course. So we will see. It all depends on the next preparation for next summer. I will give my best, of course. And if I deserve it, then I will take it. It's a big summer as well. Um, Key, you've been a pro for, what, 10 years now? Have you ever thought about taking a break, recharge the batteries, that kind of thing? <laughs> well, it's a totally different situation because I don't have national team. We don't have GB since mm. after London and there's no national team anymore. <laughs> so it's a totally different situation. I mean, the girls that are playing nonstop, I mean, year round without a break, it's incredible. I have so much respect for you guys because I take my summer really seriously. I travel a lot. I see my family. I do all of the things that you miss when you're in your season because you really sacrifice a lot, as, as you know, to be far from your family, to be focused on the game. So I need those summers, really. That is exactly recharging my battery and finding the re-motivation for the next season. Exactly. Yeah. What's left to achieve then, Milena? And who is left to achieve it with? Uh, I just need a gold medal from uh, Olympics. That's it. That's, That's it. the Easy. only thing I end, miss. End the podcast, everyone. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's the only thing I miss. Uh, the only thing I miss, I don't know. Uh, the rest, we all won. Also my national team. And, and also the gold medal from the Nations League. Actually, we never won Nations League. Mm, okay. But still, my priority is, of course, Olympic Games, that we go there and give, us, give our 100%, and then we will see. I think we have a good team to, to go and fight for, uh, for finals, but I don't know. It's all, it all depends also on, on our health, and we will see there is a lot more time to, to before Olympics. How significant is it that the Olympics are in Japan? Because I spoke to Branki about this and she talked about it starting in Japan with your first medal and then maybe winning that gold medal in Japan could be like like bookends on this incredible chapter for the Serbian It's funny team. actually, yeah, it's funny. But uh, whenever we went to Japan, we came back with the medal. It's really yeah. like... Uh, there is a good luck for us, I think, in Japan. <laughs> uh, but I don't know. I think that will be incredible because I know the Japanese people they take care about everything. So I think uh, maybe the, that will be the best so far organized. Mm. You know. Ooh, bold statement. Big, big bold <laughs> probably statement. Be, probably be the robot bold everywhere or something. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. But uh, I'm really I'm looking forward. Uh, you're not the only one. It's going to be absolutely incredible. Dave, should we do the Who Am I? Yes. Um, I, was just, I was just thinking that. I've got a couple of things to speak about. While I'm finding the uh, file key, will you set it up? Oh, set it up. That, that's podcast speak for say something interesting. <laughs> yes. Yes, that is exactly All what righty. It is. <laughs> so, Milena, we have a friend of yours from your past who sent us a little message. And the person has three clues for you. So you're going to try and guess who it is based on those three clues. Are you ready? Go We've ahead. given you so many games involving clues. Um, I know, we just... Uh... <laughs> so this is Who Am I? Right then, let's go. Hi, I'm Elena. Do you remember me? Clue one, we played together in Vakifbank. Ah, 
Okay, that was clue number one. Could you hear it? And do you want to guess who it is? I'm trying to recognize the voice. Okay, next. Oh, all right. You make the rules now, do you? Okay. Clue <laughs> <laughs> two. I was part of your Altunizada mafia. Clue number two. What was that mafia? Altunizada. Altunizada. That's the part where we live in Istanbul. Ah, okay. Okay. Are you going to have a guess? That's Loneke. Oh! <laughs> um, Key, can, can you confirm or deny? I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that. You are, you are correct. Um, we'll, play you the third, we'll play you the third clue anyway. Here we go. Clue three. We won a lot of burger ball games with our little group of monkeys. Aww. Hopefully you managed to work it out. Um, who were the oh. group of monkeys? Uh, that was Loneki and Naz and me. Ah. With the long arms. Because of the long arms, you have oh, monkeys. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a, well, you've got it in two guesses. Uh, to be fair, Key, you thought uh, Milena would get it after the first guess, didn't you? I thought she would uh, get it as soon as she said hi. <laughs> yeah, Hello, I, I, was because actually, her voice I was is, confused. Her yeah, voice I was is confused so particular. Between, between Robin and Loneke, I was confused at the, the uh, first point. Uh, they're, they're both from Poland. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, she's got a, a message for you as well, but I have accidentally closed the file, so give me a second and I'll get it back. <laughs> oh, what a scene. Oh, do you remember me? And now I can't fast Clue forward one. it. Here we go. We play together in Vakifbank. <laughs> Clue two. I was part of your Altunizada Mafia. <laughs> Clue three. We won a lot of burger ball games with our little group of monkeys. Hopefully you managed to work it out. But if not, then it's me, Lonnie. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to say that I am so happy that I had the chance to play with you. Uh, you're a great player and even a more amazing person, a true legend. So kisses from Holland. Oh, I'm about to start a cry. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, wait, no. should I read? She also sent a message as I, because Lonnie and I played together. So I sent her a message before we were going to speak. And I said, hey, do you have anything I can say to Milena? Like, do you have any secrets about her? And she, uh, uh, I want to read you what she wrote because it was so sweet. About Milena. She's incredibly ta talented, but most of all, an amazing person. She's so funny, sweet for her teammates and fun to hang out with. Her house was always our go-to place if we wanted to do something fun, game nights or just hanging out with a beer. Mile was always the person who brought us together. If I had a problem, I could always ask for advice or for help. Really an awesome, positive teammate. And besides that all, I think she's the best middle blocker I've ever watched play, both block and attack. I think she's the best in the world. I what a great review. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I started crying because... Um, Actually, Ronaki is also one amazing person, and I'm really happy that I had the chance to play with her with, uh, for four years. Unfortunately, she, she, she changed the club, but really, in these four years, also, I, I met her boyfriend, Thomas, and he's really an amazing guy. And, uh, yeah, that's what she said. That, like, we used to hang out a lot at my apartment because I was the one calling all of them to come after the game. It doesn't matter if we lose or win, just to hang out, you know, to not be alone, especially after loss. Uh, so it's really, she's, she's really cute. And I miss her a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like you guys had a good team. Yeah. So yeah. tell us about these game nights. Tell us about these, these nights at your apartment. What do you play? Yeah. Uh, it depends on the mood, but mostly we used to play Uno. Ah, yeah, okay. Uh, the cards. We play that on the train a lot. Yeah. You know, when you travel and you have the little table in between. And, you... and also I have on the uh, Xbox uh, in Istanbul, so we also had some dancing games. So oh. it's, it's, it can be really funny. <laughs> yeah. is, is that where you practice for the dancing when you win the trophies? That's, uh... Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> I, it was it was interesting though. You did sort of visibly get a little bit emotional there. You sort of your body language changed, and even though you've played for all of these teams and you've you've you know you've met a lot of people and played with a lot of different players over the years, but I'd imagine some of them really do 
sort of make an impact on you and you you make friends for life and people who you'll still want to be around and, and care a lot about even when the sort of volleyball journey ends right yeah actually i'm pretty maybe i don't look like that but i'm really emotional person uh, like like you saw that uh, even when i when i saw the message or when i was uh, listening the message that she uh, that key read i i almost started crying really because i'm super emotional I, i'm trying to not show that on the court but outside of the court i'm really really bad especially if you lose the game i i i will start crying so badly <laughs> oh really <laughs> it's not a good thing but what can i do so were they um are they sad tears? Are they angry tears after a game? What, what what's with the tears? Most mostly sad, but also also angry sometimes. If I didn't give my best on the game, that I knew that I could do more, but I could I didn't. So it depends. Really, it depends on the game. How do your teammates react when you cry? I suppose because you played with them for a long time now, it's changed. But I bet the first time they see it, that must be quite the thing. They mostly cry with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. You well, because you're both kid? in the same boat. You're all in the same yeah. boat. You either all win or you all lose. So <laughs> or we all smile or we all cry. Exactly. <laughs> um, Key, yes. you hit it very well, but Lonica's saying that Milena is the best middle blocker she's ever played with. That's got to hurt a little bit, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just ignored that part. <laughs> 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 well, I think it's fair to say that a lot of people have the same opinion, so I'm not. <laughs> fight, fight, fight. No, I'm joking. Please don't. Please don't. I'm such a lovely time. <laughs> oh, no, this that's is... the thing. And, and in fact, um, the guys sometimes ask me, you know, oh, how does it work on the team if you are closer with the other middles or do you have rivalries with the middles? And I always just, I don't know. I don't see people as position. I don't see people as competition. I don't know if you feel the same way. It's just you either click with people or you don't. I'm not thinking like, oh, Milena is a better middle than me. I'm thinking she's really cool that we're talking and laughing, you know? Actually, mostly of, uh, also in, in Cannes and in, uh, in uh, Wackebank, mm -hmm. I used to hang out mostly with the middles. Like, yeah. I was the closest with them. Talk and still crew. we are like at the same position maybe we are fighting for the position of the team but still we are, we are pretty good outside of the court yeah uh, i mean uh, that's that's a good thing you have yeah, to think like that for sure our close friend and podcast colleague matt used to play middle and he said that he'd always try and be friends with the setter because it would mean he'd get set the ball <laughs> more in the games <laughs> <laughs> And yeah. is, that, is that a frustrating thing for you guys? Because obviously the middle blocker, it's an incredibly important role. But sometimes you think, oh, guys, just please just set me the ball. I just, wanna, I, just want, I just want more ball. Just give me some ball. I'll show you what I can do. You know what is the most annoying thing, being a middle blocker? What? I mean, you have to jump 100%. It doesn't matter if you're going to get the ball or not. Yeah, yeah. So true. <sighs> like you're always sometimes convinced you feel... that you will get the ball and you don't. So it's like, okay. <laughs> yeah sometimes i feel like a chicken with my head cut off i'm just here yeah. i jump run jump back jump run over there <laughs> back turn around spin around go oh, out oh. Yeah. yeah and then go off the court <laughs> and sit for five minutes and then go yeah. back in and do the same thing <laughs> it's tough life middle blocker it's tough life um, that's what i'm telling but no one believes me yeah <laughs> Oh, come on, you, you're sitting on the bench for a half of the game. Yeah, exactly. You? <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> uh, right then, we would like to, we'd like to sort of bring this to an end. Firstly, say thank you. These have been three brilliant episodes, but we want some secrets now. I'm not sure we're going to get them because I, I think we've covered pretty much everything. So thank you for being such an open book. But we've got a segment that we like to call Off the Tape. And... Other than the obvious things, hard work, dedication, are there any secrets to your success that you can tell us about? I, I knew really, that I, really don't, I don't really I, have any secrets. I knew there wouldn't be. As I said, I mean, Keith, it's been amazing, isn't it? There's nothing's been out of bounds, and and yeah, I've already said it. But an open book. I'm I'm amazed what we've covered in these last few episodes. Yeah. I mean, I'm I, I'm surprised there's no special secret sauce. There's no like uh, really, you know, there, drinking there, really, some Gatorade nothing. or something. <laughs> there is nothing no. really. Um, and, uh, 
I don't know what would I say. You just no. you have to push and push and push and to be hard worker and everybody wants follow. something easy these days. Everyone wants you yeah. to just say, Oh, you know what you have to do? Just this and then you'll be uh yeah. it's fine. not over the night. It's not over the night for sure. Mm. Yeah. Do you think that's that's an attitude that's kind of changed between players of, of your generation and maybe some younger players coming through. Do you think it, they do expect things to come a little bit easier? I actually, I think yes. Unfortunately, because uh, I saw some young players that uh, since they started playing volleyball, they are in a good club. So they expect they will get all the things on the plate without pushing or whatever. And then uh, I go back to my time uh, not only mine, to the, a lot of players that we have to push really hard to, to get something. And it's completely different. And now you have to really like take them and push them to do something to, to earn that position in the team or whatever. And it was completely different before. I don't know. I don't know why is that, but you can see a huge difference. Of course, there is some, there are some young players that they really think about that and they're, they're pushing and they're not stubborn and they don't, they don't have that opinion. If you hadn't have um, become a professional athlete, what do you think you'd have done? I really have no idea. Probably <laughs> I would. Uh, probably I would. I would be in sport, maybe in basketball or something, because I really love sport. Mm. But I don't know. Maybe. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's, it's impossible better to, to not think about it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's really, it's really difficult. It's amazing how much you can get out of yourself when there's no plan B as well, isn't it? Yeah. You just push forward yeah, for that true. single That's goal. Um, and we're going back to, to the very beginning of the, uh, of the podcast here when you start to talk about your mum. Um, does she still come to your games? Does she make the journey to Istanbul? Yeah, she, she was twice in Istanbul, but she's uh, actually pretty old that uh, she okay. cannot travel that often. So she was twice in Istanbul. And, uh, of course, we are waiting for a moment that we, we will play in Serbia so she can come and watch the games. But in Istanbul, of course, she, she came to the gym. Lovely. That must have but been she really watched, lovely. But she watched every game on TV, so. Oh, really? Well, I'll make, I'll make sure next time I commentate on one of your games, I'll give her a shout-out. What's her name? <laughs> Radmila. Radmila. Okay. Rada. Rada is easier for you. Rada. I thought you easier for me. I'm trying, Malena, <laughs> all right? I'm trying. Goodness. I'm trying to help you. Come on. No, I appreciate. <laughs> trust me, I appreciate your help. Goodness me! If it, and there's always there's always one person at the club. It's usually sort of one of the assistant coaches beforehand, and I'll just walk down to the bench and very politely say, "Oh, excuse me, can you just help me with the pronunciation of all the names?" And I'll go with my <laughs> team sheets. And yeah, literally spell them out so I can. Uh, I can <laughs> no, it's good because you don't want to be that pronouncer who pronounces the name wrong the whole entire way, oh, and then you happens. get all of the backlash on Twitter and <laughs> oh. on Instagram. Oh, you don't know how to. Blah, blah, blah. Um, when I was, I understand that this uh, podcast is very much about you, Malena, not me. But when I was super <laughs> young and super green, I did a sitting volleyball tournament before the Paralympics, and it was th so many teams there. There was teams from Great Britain, uh, Russia, Ukraine, France, Canada, China, Japan, and China is the one place I really struggle with. Yeah. And I did such a bad job of pronouncing the names that when I'd announced them. The player who it was supposed to be would look back at me and laugh and then make his way onto the court. <laughs> and it, we were there for seven days and I tried so hard. And in the end, they just laugh at me and just go out on the court and be like, oh, whatever. <laughs> oh. For example, I have, I have troubles with Dutch names. Dutch is hard. Yeah. They have That's the like, what I... <sighs> and the, like the, the, the... Loneke Sluches. Sluches, yeah. yeah. Robin de Krauf. And a bausch. And a bausch. <laughs> it's really... And it's spelled completely differently. If you look at yeah, it on, exactly. the, on the letter, it's like bouillage yeah. or like yeah. slow to jizz. For years, yeah. for years, I thought you were Kiara Michelle. Yeah, well. <laughs> You know? I am to many people. Yes, yeah, you are. What I'm not famous enough to have my name be pronounced correctly. Uh, don't, don't, don't make me bring it up again. Key. I yeah. start going by key because it's just easier. Yeah. But mostly they also don't pronounce my name good, so don't worry. Okay. It's pretty easy, no? actually. Well, say it, say it right now so it is engraved in our memories forever. Milena Rasic. 
Milena Rashic. Exactly. Rashic. But they always say Razik, Razik. Ah. Especially in France, Razik. Rashic. Rashic. Very good. All right. Easy. Beautiful. Now I know. <laughs> Forever. It means you've got to stay at Vakit Bank for a few more years now, so at least I get the chance to put it into practice. <laughs> <laughs> um, you will not have troubles next time when you when you come from a game. I I will you don't have not. to ask assistant coach. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm hoping that Giovanni takes me out for dinner next time, but uh, but that is uh, wishful thinking, perhaps. Um, Are you think, listening, Giovanni? Yeah, Giovanni. <laughs> I think this is a lovely place to wrap it up. Key, have you got any final thoughts? Um, it was really lovely to chat with you, Milena. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much guys for having me it was really nice oh no it, 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 it really is a pleasure Milena thank you and um we're we're ever so pleased that we got to that we got to speak to you obviously aside from the success and and all of those things they're just ultimately sort of numbers on a screen but to, to get to know you a little bit better over the last few episodes for both ourselves and the supporters as well has been really lovely um, have you got a final message for the fans who are out there listening well, uh, all I can say, okay, now this situation is, is over, hopefully, but I just want to say, hey, stay safe and uh, take care about your families and about yourself and uh, hopefully we'll go back to normal very soon and uh, that's it. Perfect. Perfect. We love Milena. Milena Rasic. Rasic. <laughs> this has been the Ace Space podcast. Key Michael, when do the podcasts come out? They come out on Mondays and Fridays. And what is the hashtag? Let volleyball talk. <laughs> yes, it is. Thank I'm you. I'm getting good at this. You are. You are. Um, <laughs> I'm going to get it tattooed on my forehead so we never forget. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, thank you so much for listening. This has been the A Space. Milena Rashic, you are a hero. Key Michael, you are too. Um, stick with <laughs> us because the episodes keep coming. Great content. Hopefully you're enjoying. But until next time, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.